Let's begin with a word of prayer. A gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless the words of my mouth as I proclaim your word in the power of the Spirit. And we pray that the same Spirit will open the hearts of us assembled here to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Pastor always says you have to be generous with your acknowledgements. So, firstly, I'd like to thank God for this opportunity. I'd like to thank Pastor for the opportunity as well and for reviewing and suggesting changes. My mother for just suggesting William Barclay's Study Bible for my reference. Everyone who prayed for me for sharing the word. And also my cousin Pavitra with whom I've been doing uh, Bible studies and while doing one such Bible study, I came up with the topic for today's, wish, um, today's word. And my references, uh, William Barclay's study Bible, Gary Hemrick's sermon on a messy family tree, study of Matthew by Pastor Paul, Gospel of Matthew summary Bible project. Okay, so I don't know if you have guessed it, uh, the topic is our family tree. Uh, Who, some of you, I think, not received uh, the paper. Has everybody received it? If you've not, just raise your hands and that will be passed on to you. Okay. Small exercise that I would like you all to do. Uh, on the first page, you would see something like called a my family tree and you could just fill in uh, the boxes until you can recall right so this is how my family tree looks like so that's me there and then I have my father Reverend Dr. S. John Sundar my mother Mrs. Hema Sundar one up uh, Mr. S. John Balaya my grandfather and my grandmother Mrs. Krupama Mr. S. Paul, my great-grandfather, Mrs. Lydia, my great-grandmom, and I don't recall after that. <laughs> so it'd be great if you remember and you can recall and fill that up. We have an exercise later on related to this. Okay, so let's move on. Genealogy. So genealogy is a line of descent traced continually from an ancestor and it is the study of family origins and history. So what are the benefits of a family tree or genealogy, right? So some of the benefits are the first one being sense of purpose and deeper personal identity. So tracing family roots back through generations can help a person connect more deeply with a sense of self by learning about their family's past, where they come from, who they were, what they did, the trials they overcame, and their accomplishments and their dreams. The second benefit is family connections. Learning about common ancestors has a way of opening up doors for communication. Sometimes one's research about family origins will even end up connecting long last relatives in surprising ways. Even though they are long gone, they may still have much to teach us about our families, about history, and even about ourselves. The last one is sense of pride. Sometimes learning about our ancestors brings in us a sense of pride. Taking pride in an accomplishment of one's ancestors can instill a personal commitment to continue a courageous and righteous legacy. For example, my grandfather, Mr. Salagali John Balaya, whom we grandchildren refer to as Abba, was a brave soldier and fought for India in the Rangoon War. Right? The Rangoon is currently called uh, Burma or Myanmar. Um, I take massive pride in commemorating his great war stories, how he walked barefoot from Rangoon to Bangalore to rejoin his family. Also learning about his immense contribution to the building of the CNIGM Mispa Telugu Church and how he inspired my father Reverend Dr. S. John Sinder and my uncle, Reverend S. John Prasad, to follow his dedication to God's ministry fills me with gratitude about how our God has led my family through thick and thin 
to carry on his work. So now that we know what genealogy is, let's talk about what genealogy in the Bible is, right? So personally, genealogies for me are the most boring part to read in the Bible. I don't know about y'all. Sometimes, you know, I get tempted to skip it or sometimes I choose to just quickly skim through, right? But convicted not to miss any part of the Bible, what I generally do is I'll pick up names and say, okay, this name will be good for some baby who's coming up in the family. But then, uh, my perspective has changed since I've learned the purpose of the family tree in the Bible. Okay, it is a history of succession to help us trace God's faithful promises to his people. Biblical genealogies are telling a story. They are telling the story of God restoring to humanity the rest, rule, and relationship we had with him in the Garden of Eden. Right? So if you can trace back God, Adam, and so on, right? So with that said, let me take you through uh, Matthew 1, verses 1 to 17. Hopefully you don't go off to sleep while I read this because I have questions at the end of this. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's read Matthew 1, 1 to 17, the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinabad, Abinabad the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Azar. Azar, the father of Ezekiah. Ezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile of Babylon. After the exile of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheatiel, Sheatiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azar, Azar, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eliazar, Eliazar, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, to Babylon and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So questions to y'all? So no questions, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so uh, there are a few important things that we note from the genealogy listed in Matthew. Firstly, we see that Matthew writes this gospel to the Jews. Jews were exceedingly interested in genealogies. Matthew calls the book, the book of generation, okay? It's called Beblos Geniosis. So this phrase was very common among the Jews and it meant the record of a man's lineage. Jews set the greatest importance on purity of lineage. If a man had any mix of foreign blood, he lost the right to be called a Jew and a member of the people of God, right? And in the New Testament, there are two genealogies listed. Does anybody know where else the genealogy of Jesus is listed? <laughs> okay, great. So Matthew begins the gospel with Jesus' genealogy, and Luke also gives an account of genius, Jesus' genealogy in chapter 3 of his gospel. 
there is an interesting difference between the two. Matthew traces the earthly line of, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Matthew traces the earthly line of Jesus through Joseph, and we could call it, uh, you know, the leg, uh, legal lineage or ancestry because Joseph was not Jesus' earthly father. Whereas Luke traces the earthly line of Jesus through Mary, his mother, and this can be called the bloodline lineage of Jesus, as depicted out there. And by far, uh, the most amazing thing is that this genealogy lists the names of women, right, in a long list of fathers and sons. So now the question goes out, who are the women listed out there? They have, they are? Ruth, yes? Bethsheba, great, thank you. So, let's just look at the women listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Right? The first woman was Tamar. In Genesis 38, we read that Judah had three sons, Er, Onan, and Selah. And Judah got a wife for Er, and her name was Tamar. But Er was wicked in the Lord's sight, and he was put to death by the Lord. Okay, then Judah gave Onan to carry the responsibility to raise up an offspring for his brother. But knowing that the child will not be his, Onan committed wicked acts in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Then Judah, fearing that Tamar was the cause for his son's death, falsely promised to give his youngest son in the marriage to Tamar when Selah had grown up and sent her away to her father's house. Later, after Judah's wife had passed, Tamar disguised herself as a prostitute and offered herself to Judah without his knowledge, for he did not recognize her because she was wearing a veil. Tamar may be referred to as a deliberate seducer and an adulteress. The second woman is Rahab. We all know the story, wherein uh, Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho and in Joshua 2, 1 to 7. We read how before the Israelites crossed the Jordan, Joshua sent out spies to scot the land. And after arriving in Jericho, they decided to spend the night and how Rahab actually, you know, uh, uh, hides them and helps them escape through the window, thus saving their lives. The third person is Ruth. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows, but Ruth was not a Jewess. She was not a Jew. She was a Moabite. And according to the law, it is written in Deuteronomy 23.3, no Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay? Because all Moabites were born of incest. But we know the story about how Ruth does not abandon her mother-in-law and goes on to marry Boaz. The fourth woman we're going to talk about is Bathsheba. Bathsheba uh, was a woman who David seduced uh, from Uriah, her husband, with an unforgivable cruelty. We know how he actually put him in the front line and then Uriah dies, right? We read about this in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And later on, we read that she becomes Solomon's mother. Now, let's look at God's divine plan. Okay, we can see that Tema was referred to as more righteous than Judah himself. Rahab showed mercy to others, even though she had not received mercy in her own life. Ruth was considered loyal and faithful. Bathsheba was Solomon, the wise king. Okay, the most important thing is, it is really vital to understand that it is not their character that enabled them to be featured in the family tree of Jesus, but it was the divine plan of God all the while. Right? So Psalms 33.11 says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. So let's look at some takeaways from this passage. Okay, the first takeaway is, God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect purposes. 
If you've noticed, there is something very interestingly in common with these women. They were far from being virtuous or honorable or people with integrity. Most of them were morally irresponsible and sinners, either by birth or by choice. This makes a very important statement about how God wanted His Son to identify with man. Right? In fact, we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, what does it mean? It means that Jesus came to identify with sinners. He came to identify with people who struggle, people who fail, people who sin, and people who do not measure up. Somehow, God can use those who have greatly sinned for His purposes and fits them perfectly in the scheme of His things. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Sometimes people think that they are great sinners, that they need to get their lives together before they come to church. Well, even I was like that, right? So before I joined NFC, I was guilty of my sins. And what I would do is, I was like the lost sheep in the parable of the sheep. I avoided church as much as possible. I but religiously attended during Good Friday, Easter, and Christmas. Right? Those were the only days when I came to church. And even if I went during that time, I used to disappear as soon as the benediction of the pastor was done. Because I didn't want to be seen, because I felt like a great sinner. But this changed when I realized that Jesus came to identify and to seek and to save that was lost. Jesus said in Luke 5, 31-32, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Realizing that he chases me till I am found, leaving the 99 behind, has strengthened me in my journey with him. The bottom line is, God chooses not the righteous, but sinners. Amen. Also, remember that if you have been chosen, you don't have to be perfect to introduce people to Jesus. Okay, moving on, there's a small exercise for you all again on the uh, sheet that's been passed on to you. So here are a few people in the Bible that I've put out here. And the second column here has a list of traits of these people. And you can do this later or whenever you have time. You can go ahead and match it and see what the traits of these people were, and you would realize, if despite all of this, for example, Jacob was a liar and Moses was a stuttering criminal. Despite that, God used them for his purpose and his divine plan. This is for your reference. So moving on to the second takeaway, God breaks all barriers to claim his own. Matthew shows us in symbol the essence of the gospel of God in Jesus Christ. So here he shows us the barriers are broken or going down. So the barriers between Jews and Gentile is broken. Rahab was a woman of Jericho and Ruth, the woman of Moab, find their places within the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Rahab, Ruth, Tamar were not Jewish but Gentiles. Bathsheba married Uriah, the Hittite, and thus part of the Gentile household. The great truth is, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Here, there is the universalism of the gospel, right? Where it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. Didn't say he loved only the Jews, right? He loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Also, the barrier between male and female is broken. Names of women are not generally found in genealogies, but such names are found in Jesus' genealogy. This is a really powerful statement about the equality of women. So even as we celebrate women in this month, 
because of International Women's Day. It is important to understand that the old content is gone and men and women stand equally dear to God and equally important for His purposes. In Acts 2, 17 to 18, we read, in the last days, God, will, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on your, my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So we've seen that, right? So beautiful. If we are an example of what's happening, what God is doing for us. So Jesus came to use people's lives. He can use our lives no matter what our lives have been through. No matter the things we have done, no matter how we've lived, no matter what sin or immoral, immorality we've been involved in, all we need to do is give our lives to Him. And He will take our lives and make them new, and He will do a beautiful thing with them. Or if we have already given our lives to Him, and we've got issues maybe in our relationships, our health, our career, that we're still hanging on to, we just need to surrender it to the Lord. Give situations to the Lord. Give our families to the Lord. We need to step back and stop trying to fix things ourselves. Because God takes people like Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, who didn't have perfect ethics and he used their lives for his purpose, for something powerful, for something to bring glory to him and strengthen his kingdom for his divine plan. So God can break every barrier and use anyone he wants, no matter how fractured or broken or flawed and create miracles. The third takeaway is a family tree does not define us. Jesus' family tree did not define him. His mission and his purpose came from God the Father. Similarly, there could be some bad apples in our families, some of them we do not want to be associated with, right? There could have been abuse, abandonment, mental illness, or poverty in our family trees. But the good news is that in Christ, we are not only given a new heart, but we have given a new start, okay? We are given a new beginning and a new purpose. We are also given a new legacy that we can leave to our children. Maybe the one we did not have, but a new one that we could give to the next generation. Because Christ is a part of new beginnings. We are not destined to repeat the sins of our forefathers. We are not destined to be defined by the sins of our forefathers. In Christ, we are new creatures. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Our past does not have to define us. Jesus makes us new creatures and gives us new purpose and new identity. We need to move on and understand that we had no control over our family or the family that we were born into. But in Christ, we have a new family and new identity. Jesus lived his life for the glory of his Father without letting his family tree define or deter him. And so can we too. So the conclusion, there is a famous quote which says, the heritage that you received is not nearly as important as the legacy you will leave. Well, let me repeat that. The heritage that you received from our fathers, our forefathers, is not nearly as important as the legacy that we will leave. Because we had no choice in the heritage we received, but the legacy we'll, we are going to leave behind is our choice. We must leave a legacy that glorifies Jesus. The more, more importantly, let us be reminded and focus on our inheritance in Christ and our family tree in Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purpose to choose and bless 
a covenant people. And we are a covenant people. Through Jesus now, anyone can be adapted, adopted into God's family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures. In Jesus, we find God's grace. God's plan will, was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus, the Messiah. And wherever we have the slightest doubt, whenever we think, no, I, I, I'm not worth it, let us remember Ephesians 1, 4 to 14, that God has predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, and that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, and that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So I want to conclude by one thing, right? Our family tree, we, we actually use that sheet of paper to, to list down our family tree, but what is our family tree in God? Okay, so there is God, and there is us, you and me, so I put up my name there, and there is not just a line between God and us, but it is a cross on which Jesus died for our sins, that connects us to the family tree of God. Amen. Thank you.